Um, so I guess I'll get started. So first, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Nathan Brewer. Um, I work on Chrome DevTools uh, here at Google, and uh, and so kind of as a side thing, uh, Google really encourages us to go out and do independent stuff on our own, and so this is just kind of something I decided to do. Um, so I've, uh, I'm relatively new to DevTools and Chrome. Uh, I've been on the project for uh, right around six months or so, so I haven't really got super deep into it, but I, I've been uh, in the industry for about 10 years, so a little more than that. Um, so um, I will essentially get started with uh, just kind of explaining some basics. Um, so just uh, for the people that are here, um, can you guys uh, just kind of give me a, a round number between 1 and 10 on uh, rating yourself on your debugging slash uh, coding abilities um, uh, for web stuff? Specifically web, uh, just so I can uh, judge on where I should uh, where I should point things out. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I I can that that's pretty much about where I was planning on uh, on uh, going with this. So. First, uh, let me share my screen. Um, so you guys sh should be able to see my screen now, I think. So yeah, cool. OK, so uh, I'm going to get started here with uh, just inter uh, explaining what DevTools is, what the purpose, like what our goal uh, on the team is, and uh, like how we go about doing some of the things we do. So uh, Chrome, is, so DevTools actually sits, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's an independent project of, uh, on the side of Chrome. We are a part of the Chrome, you know, whole uh, umbrella, but we actually, uh, you can do everything with DevTools outside of Chrome. Like you, in, in theory, if all the bindings and everything were set correctly with Firefox and everything was 100%, you could run it in Firefox. There would be absolutely no issue with it. It's the, the front end is all JavaScript. Um, so everything you see, everything you're touching, this is just one giant web application. Um, all the stuff going back and forth, there's a little bit of uh, craziness going on, but you could think of it like one web socket pretty much. Um, so all the information that goes in and out of, um, uh, all the information that goes in and out from the back end is what we call it, uh, which is pretty much the, the Blink engine. Um, it interacts through a protocol, and the protocol is pretty much just a WebSocket. It's, it's, we, you, it actually can run straight through a WebSocket, and I'm going to get to that at one point because it's a very, very valuable thing to play with. Um, so first, uh, I'll start out by uh, just explaining what each one of these panels are, and then what you know so, some of the kind of hidden features in each one of these. So obviously, most of you should know what the elements panel is, the console panel, the network panel, and the sources panel. Those are the most common things that people use, and I would be pretty surprised if if you guys didn't uh, haven't touched all of those panels at some point. Console is pretty much it; literally, is the same thing down here. Um, so if, if you didn't know, you can press escape and it will bring out the console from the bottom. Um, I, I personally highly suggest people do that because it, it is, uh, if it's, it's amazing. It's great to have console just at your fingertips at all times. Um, network panel is actually mine. I own everything in network panel. So um, pretty much if you have problems with things not showing properly, you pretty much I'm going to be answering the bug and fixing it. Um, and uh, the sources panel is a very complicated panel, just like elements panel is. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll explain some of the, the key things. Then, then uh, beyond that, you have the timeline panel. Now, timeline panel and, and uh, network panel interact very similar to each other. Um, they don't perform the exact same thing. You could think of uh, uh, the network panel as like, explicitly only for network, where timeline kind of shows a lot of information, including stuff in network. Uh, profiles is pretty much anything for memory, speed, all of that stuff. Um, uh, 
Uh, I mean, you guys, others can hear me, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you probably, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't use Zoom, so I, I, I asked if they did GBC, Google Voice, and they said no, so. Um, so anyways, uh, to, to continue, so the, the, um, uh, the profiles panel does things like the heap snapshot, the, uh, the there's even the, this explicit target that you want to work with. Um, it does profiling, it does quite a few different things. I'll get into that later. The applications panel is actually a new panel. It used to be called resources, um, but resources, there was a problem with it where it was acting between a lot of different things. One of them, it was acting between network, it was acting between sources, it didn't really have a purpose. There was almost no need for it. So with the rise of service workers and a lot of the other caching abilities that have came up, we decided to repurpose it for a thing called application, which is just a general like storage information, anything having to do with what is currently stored on your computer. So cache eventually will show up here, frames will, hopefully eventually go away there's there's we're kind of in the middle of repurposing some of this so so expect this panel to actually change quite a bit in the next year or so security panel is not a really that it's it's more of a publicity thing we wanted to encourage people to you know at least do these basic things um and so that's really security panel is more of the layman's version uh like if if you go to your website and or any website and you open security panel if it's not green then it should be i mean this all of these should at least be met the rest of everything else um is is up to you audits panel uh is a situation where um it doesn't so so there there was a point where we were trying to get rid of audits panel um and we pretty much ran into issues where people still used it. And audits is kind of like a, um, we will help you just say, hey, you should not load these resources. You should async call certain things. It's kind of like a, um, it's a very, very basic rudimentary version of a profiler, like a just general page profiler saying, you know, it took a long time to do a network request. You know, maybe you should focus on improving that. Don't focus on the JavaScript part of it. Or if the JavaScript's taking a long time, it would, it would highlight that. So that's pretty, I'm not gonna get into audits because we really are trying to steer people away from audits. Um, so I, I'm really, um, I'm really not going to go too much into that. Um, so anyways, let's, let's start with sources panel. So that's the general overview of each thing. Before we get started, I wanted to really highlight the, uh, the device, uh, the, this emulation mode. If you guys don't know about emulation mode, it, it, it's, it's great. It is, it is so amazing. Um, it, it was recently heavily changed where you can now go to different uh, profiles like very simply and you can actually see how they're going to interact uh, by clicking these bars that I, I'm hoping you guys can actually see. So for example, I'm gonna reload this page and Chrome right now or, or, or Google right now thinks that I'm in um, like a laptop pretty much like a smaller. Uh, but if I actually click here, I'm gonna go to a, a mobile version and then when I reload the page, you should see the mobile, I believe you'll see the mobile site. Uh, I may actually change this. So this should, in theory, be the mobile site. Um, so if I do a Google search, everything comes in. And notice that the icon changed to a circle because it's supposed to be tap, you know, touch events. So that's the reason you can actually scroll. Um, it scrolls with your mouse at, at, the, at this point. Um, so uh, this, I'm assuming some of most of you have at least played a little bit with this. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to really touch on it, but if you didn't, if you haven't used this, it's, it's great. It's amazing. Um, the, the guy that worked on it, he did a, f a phenomenal job. Uh, so to move to the next thing. So, so let's talk about the elements and I'm sure you guys have noticed that I've been moving around and it highlights different things. So this is pretty much just a general way to just show you what's actually like what, where it is on the page. So if you actually click on these elements, you'll notice a couple things change. For one, you see it says equals equals zero. That's maybe some of you have seen that or noticed that but never thought much about it. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. But before I do, I wanted to scroll the styles panel all the way to the bottom. 
So you see this right here where I'm highlighting to the right. So this area, what it's actually doing is it's telling you all the information about where your margins are, your padding, your border. So whenever you're trying to debug layout issues of trying, trying to figure, like get things to line up properly and can't, can't figure that out, just go there and then just move around to your different elements and you'll see like, you know, oh, the, the, the width is right, but the padding is off or the margin is off or your border is interfering with it. And it, it's, it's, again, another one of those very, very useful tools. And it even highlights where the margin is on the left as you're moving around. So now let's, I'm gonna actually talk about this dollar sign zero thing because this is great. Um, now, so I have it up here selected where it says dollar sign zero. Now down here, I can say dollar sign zero and it actually grabs my node that I had selected here. So what I can actually do is do like dollar sign zero dot, you know, um, tag name, for example, and it will say it's a div. And then if I go to a script, for example, and then do dollar sign zero tag name, it says it's not a script because it is the dollar sign zero is now representing the object that I'm currently, I currently have selected. Um, you can also use, I think it's dollar sign one will go to the last one selected. So for example, I can say, let's say I'm, I'm trying to work with these two items, which is the class name underscore CY and underscore RAF. So if I'm working with both of those, I can say, I can click on one and then click on the next one. And then now I should have dollar sign zero is one of them and dollar sign one is the other. So now I can say like dollar sign one um, is same node, you know, as dollar sign zero. Uh, and I think it goes up, and, and in this case it's false. Um, I believe it goes up to dollar sign four. Um, I'm not 100% on that, but I believe four is the maximum. Um, so I should, yeah, four is the maximum um, that we actually uh, work with. So that's one. Sorry, I have my notes on my other computer. So then uh, I'm sure some of you have noticed that like, okay, so now this is giving me the, the, the node down here, but one of the problems that you'll run into frequently is you actually wanna see the, the uh, you wanna see the DOM representation. And the DOM representation for anybody that may not know is, is the object version of, of this, uh, this uh, you know, HTML in this case. Um, so it, you can actually do that by doing dir zero and you just wrap it in a function. And then now you actually have your, your DOM object. So if, if anybody didn't know that dir, it's, it's your friend. Um, so you, you can also, um, so yeah. Uh, and then you can also do XML, uh, I think it is, or maybe it's, I think it's log XML. So, sorry, console dot, I think this is it. Uh, I have it right here. It's console. Uh, actually, I'll get to that one later. So anyways, um, there, there, there's another one. I, I thought it was XML, but maybe it's... Anyways, um, so to continue, so we also had the dollar sign just by itself, and it works very similar. It, it literally is a representation of uh, document.querySelector. So, so if any of you know what this function does here, um, it's it's your best. It's a really great thing to try and figure out, like um, to to try and find items. So if you know what your class name is or something that you're working for, you can actually, you get a shortcut to it when you're debugging, you can just say dollar sign and then put div or something. Um, and then you can say dollar sign, dollar sign, and it will find all divs in this case. So you see it's array of, you know, almost 500. And then we have, um, we also have dollar sign X. And what dollar sign X does is it's the X path of it. So in this case, there's no, you know, I, well, it's an invalid XPath. Um, I think it's star slash. I can't see who that is. Okay, I have done. It's a signature. 
So I think my father. There we go. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, so to continue, uh, we have so. <clears throat> Uh, now let's go into, I'm going to skip sources or console a little bit because uh, we, we were kind of just playing around with that and I'll go back to elements in a little bit because I want to make sure that I, I highlight some of the more important things first. So uh, with modern web applications, uh, there's multiple contexts that JavaScript can run in. So for example, you can have a service worker, you can have a web worker, you can have a shared worker, you can have iframes, you can have all sorts of things that JavaScript can actually run concurrently. That does not mean JavaScript is multi-threaded. It just means that you can have multiple contexts of JavaScript working together. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to explain what that means if you don't know what it means. But think of it like multiple processes uh, that are able to run at the same time, and they have very limited communication between each other. Um, in, in those cases, we can actually, you see, Google has a, um, th this, um, the, the Google homepage actually does use a service worker, I believe. Um, and you can actually see it right here. So there's two locations for it. Over here you see threads. Sometimes it's, it's collapsed, so just make sure you expand it. You'll see threads and it says main here. And then there's another one that says new tab. So this is the new tab service worker. And so you can actually click into them. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give you an example of um, Flipkart uses it. So the web, if you go to flipkart.com, they are registered. So you notice over here, it says sw.js. So this is their service worker. Now, what that means is sw.js, if you expand it here, here's their, their JavaScript that they're running. Now, another thing that if you didn't know, you can click this little nifty icon down there. And what it'll do is unformat. It's, it's so useful when you're trying to look at minified JavaScript. And you can actually debug and breakpoint and do all sorts of things, even with this formatted version of it. So, um, so like if 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 you did have a, a minified version, you can actually just set a breakpoint here, and then if you knew where that where it was entering this function, it will break at that point. So the reason this is really important is because you can actually be debugging multiple threads at the same time in JavaScript, and it can be a little confusing because over down here. Uh, towards the bottom, there's actually these, this is another context or the, the, the same context that you see up here. Um, and you can switch between it in either location here. Um, and I highly, highly recommend if any of you don't know what service workers are or don't use them, at least understand what they're for and the purpose of them. Because they're, they, they are a very, very vital part of the future of the web and web applications. So if you don't know, do it, please. Um, we at Google here are really trying to pressure people into it because uh, it, it dramatically increases people's um, like click-through rates and happiness. Like it makes things feel so much smoother if it's set up properly. Um, anyway, to continue, so uh, I am so in in this case. Let's say I have. Uh, I'm going to go to. Um, this is my favorite debugging website, <laughs> asdf.com, because it's so simple. So over here, uh, I'm, I'm now on this, this other website, and let's say it's something I want to debug. Now, we have this thing here called snippets. Um, this is kind of like a, a feature nobody uses, and I find it so, so amazingly useful. If you right-click or command-click and say new, you get a new snippet. Just You can rename it if you want. Um, to whatever you want. But over here, you can just start typing you know, your code. So if you wanted to, um, like, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It, it can be, it's, this is just full, um, full JavaScript. Then you can just run it. And it will run almost, it's a little more complicated than just running it in the console. But it, you can breakpoint it from here. Um, you can debug it, you can do what you need. So when you're kind of trying to hack together a little part of your code that's not working properly, I highly recommend you use snippets. And you can even run snippets while you're debugging on, uh, like in your main tab, in your main JavaScript area, uh, sorry, your main JavaScript context. You can actually set a breakpoint there, move to a snippet, put your code that you want to actually see how it's gonna interact at that point in code, 
and run it from there. So it's, it's a very, very useful thing. Um, so and you see it, it's, it's logging the information down here. Uh, another thing that you probably just noticed that I did is I, you do console log. I'm assuming a lot of you know what this is, um, but there's more than just log. There's other ones, for example, there's the DIR, which I explained what that was earlier, which you can just do that. And uh, it, will, it will try and represent it as a, as a the, you know, document object model, the DOM or whatever. It, it'll just break it out into an object rather than showing you kind of a, what it thinks it, you want to see. Um, you can also, this is a really nifty thing. You can do debugger. Um, and so I'll show you how this interacts. So I'm going to hit play here. And I did not set a breakpoint there, but did you notice that it actually stopped my code? So I'm actually, I do have a breakpoint here with an inline piece of code. Extremely, extremely useful when it's very difficult to set a breakpoint. So for example, if you're running some sort of crazy JavaScript that it kind of like, it's like evaluated, for example, for whatever reason you may want to do that, which there are a few, so don't, don't hate for, on everybody for doing it, but it's, it's a really nice thing because you can actually, for example, um, let's say I have, uh, I want to do an eval on um, console log, you know, high followed by something's breaking between it, and I want to figure it out. Um, now in this case, when I hit play, notice it like everything kind of changed and now I have this over here, which is what I just ran and then it opened a new one called VM57. Now what it actually did is it saw, VM is what we call like, um, it stands for virtual machine, obvious, uh, well, if, if it's not obvious, but that's what it stands for and 57 is just the number that the that Blink, which is what Chrome runs, uh, that's just the number that the, the V8 engine and Blink gave this context, that this, this little snippet of JavaScript. Um, and so what it actually did is it, it saw, hey, you're executing some code. This code doesn't have a name to it, so I'm just going to give it some random you know, way to identify it and then give it back to the user. And then in this case, again, it's minified or ish, minified-ish, so you can actually click on the pretty print and then it doesn't do it perfectly, but it gives it good enough. And then now you can actually debug your code and try and figure out what's going on here, why it's doing what it's doing, and interact with it in the console just like you, you, know, you would normally expect. Um, so that's, uh, in my opinion, an extremely valuable and use useful thing. Um, next thing is we have uh, we have this little button over here, which is your uh, pause, don't pause, exceptions, things like that. So if you click on, click on it and it turns blue, they, it used to actually be different colors. It used to, uh, it, I think blue was like, um, I, I, I actually don't remember. It, it used to be you had to click on it multiple times to do different things. And now we set it up where when you click on it, it breaks it down and then you get the, uh, the additional option to it. So what this does is this says, if there's ever an error on the page, let me know about it. And then if you check this box here, it says, if there's ever an error on the page and it will, even if it was handled, so like if you have a try catch, even if that try catch, I will still break there. So without this, it will, if there's a try catch, it will not break. But if you have this checked, it will. Um, and then you have your watches. Um, I don't personally find watches all that useful, but some people do. Um, it's, it's just never works out in my favor, but you can add variables here. So if I do like document, uh, I will always have access to this. So a better example of that would be if I have um, a variable A and I set it to hello, if I set it to hello and then I add A here, it, you, I see it says hello. And if I say A equals goodbye, um, now notice it, it did not actually change because you got to hit refresh. But if, the, if it changed, every time you hit play or uh, step into, step out of, you know, any of those steps, it will actually update this automatically. So granted, I was doing things in the console, it didn't update, but it, 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 does, it updates almost always. You, you rarely ever need to actually click refresh. Again, I don't personally use watches all that much, but 
for different people do. Call stack, I'll show you uh, an example of call stack uh, in a little bit. Um, and then we have our scope. Scope is very similar to watches. It has to do with your call stack as well. Get into that a little bit. Breakpoints, this lists your breakpoints. So if I set a breakpoint here, you see here's my breakpoint and you can enable it, disable it. Um, not, most people are probably aware of that. Then you have your DOM breakpoints. Um, I believe DOM breakpoints, XHR breakpoints, and all, all these other ones I believe are going to move uh, here in the next uh, probably month or two. Um, but that right now they're living here. Uh, so what an XHR breakpoint does is if the URL contains something like, I'm gonna say, you know, a slash, for example, uh, and then I say fetch slash, it set an XHR breakpoint. Um, and so fetch, uh, if you don't know, fetch is like kind of a replacement-ish, um, it's a replacement-ish version of, of you know, an XHR request. Uh, it's not, it, there is a spec for it, but I don't believe everybody's using it. So don't, don't I, this is just me being lazy and not wanting to do the full version of it. So, but it actually did a breakpoint here because it saw, hey, you're doing a, a fetch request, you're doing an XHR request of some sort. Um, and so I'm gonna break right there because you did it. And so you can actually set your breakpoints here uh, if you're trying to figure out like where in this page is it calling this magical, uh, you know, JSON file, you can actually just set your breakpoint, from, you know, and say, is just put the name that it contains. Extremely, extremely useful. Um, and then you have your event listener breakpoints. Event listener breakpoints are do just like what they sound, uh, sound like. So if there's ever an event that gets triggered that matches one of these criteria, it will break. So you see XHR is down here as well. It's because they're very similar. I mean, one just filters, the other one says on all pretty much. Um, and, or actually these ones give you more specific if, if an XHR times out, if it's when it, you know, if it gets aborted for whatever reason, et cetera. Uh, you have your uh, did you, pointer breakpoints for when, just like it shows. I mean, the, the, what these are designed to do is uh, if you have something that's listening for a specific event and that event, you're trying to figure out why, like, is it my code that's breaking it? Is it the library that has it wrong? Where is it wrong? This, this is a very nice tool to help you. You can, it, 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 will, get, it will show where the entry points are coming in from. Um, and then you have your event listeners and event listeners are very similar to the event breakpoints. <laughs> um, your event listeners will generally show you uh, where things are being listened to on, on your page, your, you know, your, your global scope or whatever you're currently, you know, your current context or whatever. Um, so that, that one is a little bit more advanced, so I'm not going to go a whole, whole lot into that. Uh, then you have this very, very useful button called async here. Why it is not checked by default, I have no idea. Highly recommend everybody always keep async checked. It is so, so useful. Now, I'll show you what, ace, what this checkbox actually does. So let's say I have something like a function here um, called A, and it returns a promise. Um, oops. It returns a, a promise, and this returns oops, sorry. So if I I'm gonna run So I'm doing this on my laptop, and not exactly. So now I have this variable a here. So if I do, if I call a, it returns a promise. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set a breakpoint here, or I'm going to do debugger, and now I'll show you actually how this interacts. So hit play, and then I'm going to call a, and then boom, it, it breakpointed right here automatically for me. Now if I look, here's my call stack. And my call stack says that I have an anonymous function, which is what I typed down here. Uh, actually, I'm gonna, let me change this so it's less confusing. There. 
So now I have, so I just ran this. And so I have my anonymous function, which came from here. Then it went into the A function and then it, and then it just, it, it set my breakpoint. So this is my call stack. And my call stack is saying, at e here's each point of how I got to it. This is where I'm at now. And then if I go down one, this is where it came from. And then if I go back one more, it says this is the original origin of it. So what this, the reason this is so amazing is what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say set timeout. And I am going to put this success inside it and say after 500 milliseconds, run this success code right here. So now when I hit play, wait, oh, sorry. Uh, and set a breakpoint. So now when I hit play, it paused. Now notice my call stack. The reason this is a very confusing and difficult thing to debug is because you're trying to figure out where this came from. And in this case, it actually came, it's a timer. So it didn't really come from anywhere. It, it's, it's, it just popped into existence because something registered it and it registered this function, which this is a, if you didn't know, this is EC, uh, ES6, uh, you know, it's, it's a closure, like quick closure binding because I'm lazy. Um, so what, what it's doing here is it's saying, so with this unchecked, it pretty much says, my uh, my stack just says set timeout like that it just came from set timeout i have no idea where it came from to to elaborate to show this a little bit more let's imagine that i have a function here called my return function and i'm going to create another function called my return or i'm going to create that function and then put my code here pass in success So now when I run this, so now it pretty much says like I just appeared in my return function. So if you're trying to debug a complex piece of code that things are getting moved from place to place to place, it can be quite difficult to do. So when you turn a, when you check this box and then if I rerun it, I should see it differently. Oops. I should uncheck some of these. Sorry, I, I like to freestyle things, so okay, now let's try this. There we go. So now when it's checked and then I and then I play through it. Now notice it says it says here's my call stack, and then it says there's a there's a set timeout async. Now I can click on these and it's showing me, it's highlighting the lines of where they're at, but it doesn't give me a call stack. I can't actually go to that context. There's internal reasons on why we cannot do that. Um, and I'm not going to explain them, but just, just know that like for efficiency, uh, for performance reasons and a lot of other reasons, we can't do it. But what this does is it allow it shows you here's where we entered, like here's where the set timeout came from. So in this case, you see it came from inside this promise, which it's showing line two, I believe that's a bug. It should be saying line three, but it's always within a reasonable area. So it's saying it came from this promise, and then it came from, which came from this function, which is A, which came from an anonymous function, which is, you know, out here. So this is extremely, extremely useful if you don't, if you didn't know that. Um, the, let's see what else there's you I mean, I'm sure most of you know what step into step out of step over all those are um, now I'm gonna kind of uh, shift over a little bit and I'm going to oops, um, oh, I played this too many times so I'm just gonna refresh okay so uh, down here, there's a whole bunch of hidden panels. Um, so you see animations, console, history, network conditions, etc. cetera. Uh, quick source, this is pretty cool. Um, well, you can't be in sources, but let's say you're working in network and you're like, okay, uh, yeah, this, it matches this, and you're wanting to type things, and it's actually changing it over here. Notice all this code that I just typed in. It's changing in both locations. So this is a really nice, like, quick way to get from, you know, to, to the code that you're currently working in. Um, you have your sensors panel, and if you work on a lot of mobile devices, this is extremely useful. Um, 
it, you can change, you can emulate different orientations, you can, uh, you can emulate different types of, of touches. And so for, uh, this is actually was recently changed. Uh, and I can actually click and drag and notice it's, it's moving. Uh, it's showing me like this is the orientation the phone would be in under this specific condition. Um, and so, and here's actually where, what the orientation would look like to the phone. And here's like approximately what the phone would look like. Um, that, that's actually a new feature that, um, that a guy named Eric just finished. Um, so then there are, uh, you have rendering. I, I'm actually not going to go into a, a lot of these because they're super, super complicated <laughs> um, and they're very, very specific. So another one that I wanted a lot of people to know about is control shift F. Um, we do actually have a global search um, or command shift F depending on if you're a Mac user or not, which I have mine rebound to something else. But you can also go over here and then say search and then you can just search all of your code for this. So if I do G, G, uh, was it G, J, I think? So somewhere and it'll actually, you can click on it, it'll take you to that line. Because um, it's not intuitive, you wouldn't think that that's necessarily where it is in, in this case. Another one I wanted people to know about is the con uh, Command P menu. Please, please use Command P. Um, it will dramatically increase your development speed. Um, what Command P does is you can type, you can press Command P and you can just start typing the name of the file and just jump to it. So, you know, you're in here and you say, uh, I know it's branding.css. You type brand, you see it pop up, you press enter, you go to it, now you're in the file. You don't need to go over, click sources, expand your tree, figure out where it's at. It figures it out for you. It's, it's extremely useful, it's very smart, it, it tries to learn uh, what files you frequently use and it will automatically jump to those. Um, more often than, than uh, less, less hit files. Um, uh, let's see, right, let me pull up my notes real quick. Um, oh, uh, okay, so separate carrots. This is another one a lot of people don't know about. You can uh, press control and then you can click on multiple places in sources here and it's, placing multiple carrots. Now notice when I'm moving, it's actually moving these other carrots. So one example is let's say I have function here and so I wanna replace this function and this function with something else. Now I can just type whatever I want and it's changing in both locations. So really useful when you're just trying to like work with, you know, modifying multiple pieces and it's going to be the same code like, oh uh, well I missed a comma in all these places rather than like trying to arrow navigate you can just like click command click command click command click just go all the way down and just type one comma and then they all now have a comma uh, another one and I find this one even more useful you can do uh, shift shit what is it shift alt or shift uh, okay well I have mine rebound so I, I actually can't show you but uh, I it, um, what what to do is you you type shift and I think uh, I think it's alt. Um, I I have uh, alt and control or control and command on my Mac uh, rebound to something else. So I I can't actually show you on this computer specifically. And then you can press the down arrow or down key when when you're doing it. What it'll do is it'll make your cursor long. So it will span multiple lines. So for example, um, I, I really wish I could show you this. <laughs> But what you can do is, let's say you have something where, for whatever reason, you, you know, you go to, um, uh, I don't know, let, let's say you go to, to GitHub, and I'm just gonna find a random project. Let's say, let's do Node.js, and just go to one of these files. Let's say this JSON file, not that JSON file. Um, So let's say, <laughs> this is not working in my favor. These are all readme's. Okay, well, let's say that you have a file and it, it put in, like you, you wanted to copy the code and it just put in a bunch of line numbers um, because it's a ter you know, terrible program. So let's say I do, and GitHub's too good at this. 
but uh, in, when you copy it, it's, it's actually copying like a bunch of spaces at the beginning or at the end or something like that. Really useful because you can actually just paste them in here and then um, you can paste them in here and then you can do your shift, um, uh, shift command, I think it is, or shift alt and uh, down arrows and then it will span the multiple lines. You just hit delete or backspace a few times, get them all out of the way. Um, Okay, uh, next, I'm, let's go over uh, networking because this is actually my specific area. Um, so we have the, we have this nice little thing here, which is called, you know, it's the overview and it's this, ti it's this timeline over here and it's shown up here. Um, it's really nice when you know like this is mine and I only want to look from here to here. You can actually just highlight it and it will only show the, the, um, uh, requests that actually had events between those two time between these two uh, time spans um, you can up here the, once you show your filter bar which is this button here um, you can actually filter by XHR JSON J or uh, JavaScript CSS your images your media your web sockets you know anything else that might be coming in um, you can hide data URLs because nobody nobody likes data URLs um, to, or to look at them. When you click into some of these images, or, or sorry, some of the, some of these files, um, it's pretty smart at what it does. So if you go in preview and, and uh, response are going to be uh, changed most likely in the near future. So let's use an example like um, um, I will use. Uh, Actually, let's let's go to websockets. Dot, so web, websockets.org. Echo dot HTML, I think. Yeah. Okay. So turn off my debugging. Okay. So I'm gonna connect to this websocket here. And then I'm going to fill I'm gonna use this nifty bar up here and say only show me websockets. Here's the websockets. I can see here's all the frames and um, oops, hide that. Here's all the frames of what's being sent. So I can actually, I think it's this one. Send, oh, no, it's this one. So as I type in here, I can say like, uh, let's say I had some JSON and my JSON said like, hello, goodbye, send. Here's the hello, goodbye, and notice it actually split it out into JSON for me here, um, whereas this one it did not. So this is really useful if you're ever working with WebSockets, uh, you know, very, very useful. Um, your headers panel will show you all the cookies and, you know, all the information that was sent from both from and to the server. You can click on view source here and it will show you the more raw data, whereas this is kind of just easier to see and visually understand. Um, and then we try and break out some of the information that just doesn't, you, you don't need to see necessarily like, or you, you may want to see separately, like your query string, you know, different servers can actually look at query strings in different ways. We just use the most popular, um, in, in, in this case. So, um, then we have, um, sorry. Uh, you can obviously filter up here, uh, a little bit of a hidden feature is you can say, minus uh, has, for example, or has response header. And you could say like, I don't want anything that has like, um, I don't know, like a con, you know, cache control or, you know, date or something like that. And it will just filter those out. Um, th these are all, you know, uh, things that have not completed. Um, and that that's, again another useful one you so minus and then you can type anything and it will just not it'll filter it'll show anything but that if you just type it it will show whatever that contains it um, you can right click up here and then you have additional information that you can actually just display this is getting changed I just submitted a couple patches um, so this whole menu here is going to be changed in the future uh, in the near future um, where you will be able to add custom headers and things um, you can hover over these and it will show more information like this request is queuing here it's stalled and it's showing you how many milliseconds each request took um, and then if you want to know more information about that there's a link here 
Um, highly recommend you click it and look at it if you're very confused because you will be. It's this information's complicated, um, and I, to be honest, I work on this and I don't even understand it 100%. Um, you can. Um, the, that's a, another breakout of this. Um, from here, there's there's the initiator thing. So I can see all these resources being requested, but I'm trying to figure out like why are these reports. Re uh, requests being actually uh, called or asked for. So I can actually just click on it here and it takes me right here. This is the specific line in this file that asked for this resource. Um, it works with XHR requests. It works, it works for almost everything. There's a, there's a few bugs like here, favicon. Well, there isn't really one, but the, here's some TTFs. These actually do have initiators. There's just some bugs with them right now. Um, so here I can see right here, this is where this WebSocket was called. Um, and then uh, here, um, let's see, what else? Uh, you can hold shift. This is a really uh, a fairly useful thing. You can actually hold shift here and it will show you all the things, all the dependencies. Like I cannot show anything of this until this other thing is loaded. Um, so if you're trying to like get, it's called time to first paint or time to first meaningful paint. A um, little bit advanced terms, but uh, it's trying to get your page to display as quick as possible, but not necessarily have all the content so to, to get to the user. If I hold shift here, you can see main.js. I can't load this main.js until this main.js is resolved up here. He, it, once this main.js is resolved, it will then load the ones in red. So if you hold shift, that's actually how you get to these. It, this is something that, uh, I mean, it's, it's really, I didn't even know about until I joined the team. So, um, and then we're gonna get into timeline. Timeline and profile and application are gonna be the last things that we touch on. So timeline here is uh, initiate with recording and then I'm going to refresh the page and then uh, record it. And then this is going to give me something that's very difficult to understand. <laughs> So that's the reason, so, but it's extremely useful. You can just zoom in just like anything uh, in most of these areas and just navigate around to, to figure out what's going on. So let's say you have a situation that you're trying to figure out why is my page be taking so long to load and I can see it's happening between here and here. So you can actually click into this and you can see, oh, well there was a style recalc or there was a resource that was being requested. So like over here, you see the red up here. Um, so this frame took a long time. It took 300 milliseconds for, for this to resolve. And you can move around and see there was a style recalculation, there was a layout, there was some JavaScript and here's the specific JavaScript that was executed. What each piece of the JavaScript and where, you know, why, what it took and what parts of the function um, actually like took a long time to run. And these little, these smaller ones under it are the, um, so you have like this function, it couldn't resolve this function until these other sub functions were resolved. Um, I'm not gonna go really deep into this part because this, it's very complicated, um, but I wanted to ex at least expose it because it's, it's a very, very valuable tool. Um, and then we're gonna get into profiles. Now profiles contains some, or I should say timeline contains some of the information that profile says. So I'm gonna do record CPU profiling here, and then I'm going to say like connect, and then send, and I'm gonna stop my profile. Now here's all the JavaScript that was executed um, between those two, the, the time it took me to do that. And it's telling me exactly how many milliseconds each one took and like what the, the need of each one was. You can go into it, you can expand them and go and really deep, uh, dive deep down. And you can even click on the files here on the right and it will take me to that specific line that that function or this the, where it was at. Now you notice when I did that, sources changed a little bit and now it shows me these, uh, it kind of gave me more information on the left. This is actually showing me how many milliseconds each, like at this point, it took you know six milliseconds to resolve this function here. It took one millisecond to resolve this one and one millisecond to resolve this one. Very useful if something is, is taking a very long time in JavaScript. Um, there's even, um, this is just a, a, I'm not gonna explain this very deeply, but you can do uh, console.profile 
and profile and profile end and this will give hints to to the um, profiler to say like to pretty much tag it and to give you more information easier that you know specifically of what you're trying to to get um, and then there's more in this panel other than just uh, the job the JavaScript CPU profile there's also the heap snapshot and the heap snapshot says here's my here's all the objects in memory that JavaScript is using um, and here is what they look like and what is holding on to them so this this is very large and it takes a long time so that I, I was that's the reason I'm kind of skipping some of this stuff is because they're, it's a bit advanced. So sometimes these variables will have names to them. So here, for example, here's all the functions. Every single function is, is right here. I can see each one of them. I can expand it and see information that, that it's holding. Like I can see it has a variable called UTC that this function actually needs to hold a reference to. And that's a reason it can't be cleaned up by the garbage collector automatically. Um, so some of these just give uh, numbers and that's because the, they're efficiency reasons and a few other reasons. But um, so like this is actually an object and then I can click into it and I can see what it looks like. Oh, well, I, I can see like it's a DOM object, what it contains, what's inside it, things like that. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to use, so I'm, I'm not going to go really deep into that. Uh, record allocation time and record uh, allocation profile. I'm not going to get into those because they're even more advanced and we're already a little bit deep right now. Uh, we'll, now we'll go into the application panel. Application panel has manifest. Pre pretend it doesn't exist. Um, it's it's uh, service workers completely took over manifest. So please don't use manifest anymore. Um, service workers, again, please use them if you don't. Uh, I'm going to go back to Flipkart because they actually have a service worker. So here's the service worker, here's all the information about it. Notice it changed states a couple times. If you're working in service workers, it's very difficult to register, unregister, figure out what's going on, why is it working, why is it not working. I wanna use a service worker, but I wanna bypass all network requests. You know, I wanna emulate offline mode and things like that. Um, so you can actually do that all from here. Uh, click on this, so. So redirect failed, I can see that. Uh, failed to fetch one of the, the resources in here. This gives me information inside the service worker on what failed in, um, in it. You can register, so a service worker, for those of you that don't know, a service worker can actually, it lives independently of your page and you can have multiple tabs open and it, will, it can use the same service worker. So it's pretty much like multi-threading uh, or multi-process, and then you can kind of connect to, uh, to this one service worker. And service workers, what they're actually amazing at is they can be registered to dispatch every single network request through it. So that means that you can now control every single resource, every image, every, you can control, have 100% control of all your caching, um, it, there's even a caching API or you can build your own in JavaScript, but the most important thing, it will dispatch everything through your service worker if you tell it to. Um, so, and it, it will do it even from before your page is loaded. Once, your server, once you visit the page one time and it registers a service worker, you can, it will then from that point on, the next time that page is loaded, before it even asks for the initial HTML, the initial you know, request, it will go to your service worker and say, what do you want me to do? It's very, very useful. It can also handle push requests. So you, your server, you, and you can manage that however you want to. You can hold the web socket. You can, uh, you can register time events. And even though the user is not on your page, uh, it will kind of run periodically in the background. You don't have 100% control of it, but you have some at least. Um, it gives you the ability. Uh, you can simply clear all your cache and your cache storage um, here. Um, you can view some of the things that, that is actually being used if, uh, in local storage if you use local storage. In this case, they don't use any and they have a couple cookies here. Um, and then you have your, here's actually their cache that their service worker is using. Uh, and so this is every single file that is currently cached that they they manage this cache themselves and they're using the cache api um, that is given to service workers 
uh, your frames here, uh, the, don't, don't worry about this right now. This is resources, pretty much. Um, you can get that both in sources or network panel. Um, and then, uh, let's see. And then I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna jump back to elements. Um, so if you notice down here when I said like document dot uh, like body, for example, I can actually right click here and I can say uh, reveal an elements panel and it will jump me to the body. So um, let's do it again. So if I right click and say reveal, it will move my cursor to body. So if I know in my JavaScript, it has a reference to this very specific uh, div or something like that, you can actually just console log it here and then right click on it, say reveal in DOM. Uh, another useful one is you can say, um, let's see if I can find, uh, uh, let's see, flip cards, so they probably have like, uh, so if you have a, um, let's say I define a function called A and it has some code inside it that does whatever, um, and then I, I know I have this function somewhere, I just don't know where, you can type it down here and then you can click on the code itself and it will take you to where it's defined in the code. Stupidly useful um, because a lot of times you know the name of the function or you're, but you just don't know where it's at or it has a reference to it. It has like a, a callback but you don't know where that callback was originated from. Just type it down here and then click on it. It, it takes you right to where the callback came from. Um, you can uh, back to elements panel. So from here, there's all these styles. You can enable disable styles. This is, uh, it's not advanced, but I'm hoping most of you have at least played with this a little bit. Um, one of the ones that I'm surprised people don't know about is you can click on these and it will take you to the CSS and where it's defined. You can also pretty print your CSS. So right here is that content that, um, that was right here. And let's say I'm looking for this specific piece here and I see it says index one, just click on it, pretty print it. And here's where that information is defined. Now this is going to potentially, uh, and then you can uh, check and uncheck these. And what this is actually doing is it's literally commenting out the code. Um, sorry, I'm trying to move fast because I'm running out of time, but um, so you can, you can actually just define your own properties by just double clicking or clicking once and you can say like, you know, display none and the whole thing goes away. And as I'm typing, it's like doing, it's applying these. So you can actually arrow up and down on these and it will like apply each style like retroactively. It's, it's, it's amazingly useful when you're trying to get padding. So if I do like um, padding, it's, I say like zero and then I can use an up arrow and you can see it's moving off screen very slowly as I press up. Um, so it's really nice to try and get things to line up um, because you don't need to like apply it, refresh it, apply it, refresh it. You don't need any of that. You can also emulate what hover over events are, like what it would be like when you hover over just by uh, clicking hub and then checking the hover or if it visited or whatever the case is. Um, uh, you can edit like add, add, oh and then uh, you can edit your HTML in here so you can either click on this and say right click and say um, uh, edit as HTML and then you can just straight up just do whatever you want to do in there and then click out and it will apply it in like immediately um, you can also do it to just specific attributes and so if you're trying to hack things up a little bit um, you can break, so you can right click on one of these, uh, for example, uh, this is a script, but let's say you can right click on body, for example, and say break on a subtree modification. And then in theory, um, I guess, I, I think I did that wrong. Um, oh, uh, that's, it's, yeah, it's because the subtree actually wasn't modified. <laughs> Um, but you, you can actually uh, set specific breakpoints to say like, I know something somewhere is changing an attribute on this DOM node. I need to figure out where it's coming from. You just right click on it, say break on attribute modification of it. And then, and then 
and interact with the page to figure out what's doing it, and then it will break right when that attribute gets modified. Um, again, another it's. Uh, then there's uh, to jump back to sources real quick, um, and then I'm going to try and wrap up. But back to sources, you can right click here and say add folder to workspace. Um, now, what this will do is if you are using a uh, if, if all your stuff is locally on your computer and it's being served from your computer or a network drive or whatever the case is, you can add it to, uh, add it to your sources over here and then what it will do is uh, it will, instead of keeping two references to it, it will bind them into the same one. And so what that means is that, for example, you can control S and save and then it will not only take effect immediately, but it will also save it for you. So as you're changing these, um, so for example, let's say I have this service worker here, the server, server worker file here. Uh, I, I didn't show this. Uh, this is another really useful one. You can actually just change code in line here. Um, actually, I can't do it to that file. Um, let's jump through to this one. So you can, I can actually, I should be able to. Hmm. This one's not on. Let's, let's jump over here. So I can actually change both this inline, which is, this is a CSS file, but I can actually change my JavaScript. So if I loaded like this crazy JavaScript here, um, it's really slow because it's a giant file. But um, you can actually do inline modifications. So I guess I'll just show you. So let's say I had like, you know, console log, you know, ASDF, and then I'm gonna, oops. Let's say I have a breakpoint. So I, I'm right here, I can actually, I should have used a, a stable version instead of a debug version of Chrome. Um, but what you can actually do is you can click into it and then you can actually do live modifications. And so at, you can, set your cursor, do whatever you want to do, and then you can, you just do it, and then you control S or save it, and then it will actually push that all the way to VA and update everything. So not only, like, what you're currently looking at is now this source code. Um, so you don't need to refresh. It's, it's, it's a pretty amazing, I, I, I don't know how the V8 guys are amazing. That, that's all I gotta say. Um, and uh, let's, uh, that's, Pretty much all of it. Let me let me look at my notes one more time. And make sure I didn't miss any major points I wanted to do. Um, oh, this is a, one, uh, another trick. You can do dollar sign underscore, um, and it will return the last return thing in in your console. So, so let's say I have something that was like you know um, some function a. That's just some function. Just do it this way. And then I actually, I was like, ah, I wanted, I actually wanted to hold a reference to that. You can just do dollar sign underscore, and this holds your uh, last thing that you type. So you can actually do dollar sign underscore dot like call or something. Um, uh, let's see, source maps, I didn't touch into that, but what source maps allow you to do is uh, if certain minifiers, and it's kind of a newish thing in DevTools, so it's, it's going to be buggy, but you can actually uh, map your JavaScript to, um, so if you're transpiling your code, your transpiler can map it to, um, to using this, this uh, there's this format, like the open source format, I, I don't remember the name of it, but it will, you can map your JavaScript to this other code and then DevTools will show it to you in the other code. So let's say you have Java and then your Java gets transpiled into JavaScript. In that case, you can, DevTools will show you jo the Java and then your console, you can type into it the Java variable names. If you minify your code, your minifier can give you a source map. And then when you see it, you're gonna see your original code 
but it's actually the, the back end is going to see the minified version. As you type your commands in, it's you, you can type in the variable names of how you see it in the original code and it will convert that into uh, what the, the um, convert that in automatically to your, uh, to what the, the minifier actually turned it into. Um, that one I'm going to have to defer you guys to some sort of other resource um, to look uh, to get more information. Uh, H2 and HTTP, um, th this is just informational. Uh, highly suggest you look it up, understand what it means. Um, in a nutshell, it allows you to uh, the server to send things before the browser actually asks for them, so, uh, send resources. This is a standard, so it is now the lay of the land. Um, it is fully, every browser now supports it. Um, and so what it allows you to do is to say, let's say I, you have a CSS file, a JavaScript file, and uh, a couple images, and you can't do anything on your page until at least those are, are loaded. Your server can send those before the browser even knows it needs them. It's, it's really cool. Um, uh, let's see what else. That's, that's pretty much, uh, that's most of what I wanted to get into. I, I know I kind of rushed it and I didn't go into extreme detail in a lot of these. Um, one thing I suggest you guys use Canary when you're doing development. Uh, if you don't know what, this is actually Canary right now and you noticed a couple things were broken. We need people to tell us when things break because getting something to be fixed on Canary, we can do literally the next day. When something breaks on, uh, when something breaks on stable or on, um, uh, on stable, it, we can't actually update that for months. So it's, if, if you let us know about it beforehand, we can fix it immediately. So please, we, we highly encourage developers to use Canary. You get the latest and greatest. It's, it's, it's really nice. Um, Canary is just a, it's a version of Chrome just before everybody else. It's like the alpha version is the best way to think of it. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, most of what I wanted to talk about. So is there any questions? Any, I'll give like maybe five or 10 minutes or so. Uh, anybody? Nothing? Uh, you could type it if you don't want to talk or whatever. Okay, well, cool. Um, so I guess uh, I will take off here and um, and so have a good night and yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, actually, it's a good question. Uh, did I go too fast? Did I cover too advanced or too simple things? I mean, I, I would love uh, feedback. Just, I mean, be blunt. Uh, the worst advice you can get is no advice. So I don't know how often I'm going to do this. And uh, our developer advocate, he said that he usually doesn't do these type of talks. So. I guess I'll ask a question. Um, was this talk um, directed more at the different uh, features and functionalities of uh, DevTools or actually how to use DevTools to uh, go through a debugging session? Uh, this, what I was, my goal in this was more of to show the tools that DevTools has um, because there's a lot of things that people don't use and we truly believe that they're very useful. It's just people don't use them and we're trying to figure out like, like, is there a reason? Um, I mean, there, there's like, for example, timeline. Uh, whenever you're trying to figure out why is my page taking a long time to load, it, timeline's there. It will tell you everything you could possibly need to know to, to solve your problem. But we found that it's like, I think 0.1% of developers actually use it. So the, what I was trying to do is give a, a shotgun of all the different things and then whatever you specialize in, whatever you find useful out of it to use them. Um, everybody knows how to do, or I hope everybody knows how to do basic debugging. I just wanted to do 
at least show the tools that we already have developed um, rather than like, here's how you should go about doing things. I just wanted to present them. So. Got it. All right. But yeah. Yeah. Very informative. Uh, there are a, a definitely uh, uh, a lot of uh, information and tips that I picked up tonight that I'll hopefully I'll implement into my uh, going forward debugging strategy. Yeah. The, the biggest takeaways that I could uh, suggest people to use, um, if you don't use Command P or Control P to open your files and to navigate around, please do. I, I really, that is by far the most useful thing. That I, if, if you don't use it, definitely, definitely do. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I would say the, the next biggest thing would probably be, um, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I would say maybe the next biggest thing would probably be using, at least knowing about the, that you can just type debugger um, or, or, you know, in <clears throat> have it break at those specific spots. That, that's a really useful thing. Um, it sucks because it will always break there until it goes away, but it's at least good to know that you can use it under those hard things to debug. So. Right on. Uh, the, um, uh, that feature which you showed, which uh, you can uh, edit the code and automatically updates the source, is that a new feature or is that a third party tool that, or plugin that uh, uh, you can uh, stack it on top of Chrome? So uh, everything I showed you is stock. The, stock. The, what you're actually looking at right now, like this version of Chrome that I'm using is like, it's from last night. It, it's, there's nothing in it at all. So everything you're looking at is, is in every version of Chrome. Um, so, so in other words, it's, yeah, there, there's no third parties. You can do more. Um, uh, you, you, there are extensions that you can use and there's some really great ones, but I really don't want to go into that because we actually have a developer advocate and he explicitly does that stuff. So he has a lot of talks. Uh, his name is Paul. Um, so Paul Irish, if any of you know who he is, he's actually in my, uh, he's one of my project managers. And then uh, Paul uh, Backhouse, he's our current uh, developer advocate. So um, it, he, they, they both have lots and lots of talks. I mean, Paul Irish is, he's very, very, very well known. I think he has like 200,000 Twitter followers. So just himself. Um, but yeah. Uh, Beyond that, uh, that's that's the major. I mean, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but yeah, sure, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for your for your time, and uh, it was a great uh, great session. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out, and uh, I will see you guys. Good luck when with everything, and uh, yeah. Just please let us know. CRbug.com. It's CRChromebug.com. Uh, and uh, just, just if you find an issue, just, just tell us. I mean, there, there's been times where we've had we, we've went months and months and months with a very serious issue and didn't know about it. So, anyways, thanks all.